good evening and welcome to our service this evening. Let's take our salt box and turn to 208. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 208 this evening. And we'll stand together as we sing, Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing flood power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 208, standing and singing together this evening. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood? for that singing in you may be seated this evening. And what a blessing it is to know that we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, cleansed of our sin and clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Well, if you have your prayer bulletins there, let's go over a couple of the prayer requests this evening, beginning with our missionary letters. Our first missionary family this evening is Eric and Bonnie Bowmaster in Lewiston, Maine. And he writes and says, praise God, that he has kept our church safe and family safe from COVID throughout the past year. We have not had any drop in attendance by our members due to the fears of COVID. Uh, we had a men's retreat up in Lee in October. Uh, he did mention that visitor attendance, however, has been low this year with the continuation of the fear of COVID. So pray for the Bowmasters and the work there in Maine. And then...
Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. This is the day the Lord hath made. We're to rejoice and be glad in it. What a, and we're just so thankful for the life, the strength, the health that you have given us. Thank you that we can gather together in your house and worship you. Uh, and that we can come together as a family and pray. And that you promise to hear and answer those prayers. Uh, we do pray, Father, for our missionaries. We think of the bowmasters up in Maine. We pray for them and the work there. As they head into the winter months, that you'll enable them to uh, just keep the doors of the church open, that they would not have a lot of infections or illnesses, that the weather would not inhibit their ability to meet. Uh, we pray as well, Father, for uh, the McDaniels out in New Mexico working with the Navajo people. Uh, we pray, Father, for this pastor that is from their supporting church whose wife and son was murdered. We pray, Father, that you would encourage his heart, strengthen him, uh, and, Father, just be with his church as well as it's devastating not only to the pastor but to the church family as well. And then we pray for Judy Joins. We're thankful that she continues to serve the Lord and, and still has outreach ministries to the many on the mission field where her and her husband served over the years. Pray for the work in Mexico as well as the work in the Philippines. We do pray for this uh, Deem family. Uh, Brother Paul went home to be with the Lord in December from the COVID. Uh, we pray for his wife, Debbie, and we trust that the, the bags that Judy had put together for the children in Mexico were able to make it or will be able to make it, Father, in your time. We pray for the Barleys in Japan. We thank you for them. Uh, thank you for these that have been visiting. We pray for their salvation as they come to the church and sit under Brother Barley's preaching that you'll speak to their own heart about their spiritual need that they might be saved. And again, we just thank you for the time to be in your house and in your word tonight, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, tonight we come to the third section in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 12 to 16. Now, we're, we started live streaming our services on Wednesday night here at the beginning of the year because we're streaming them down to the nursery so they can watch them. So rather than me walking around down there, I'm going to stay up here in front of the camera <laughs> Make it, you're all set for me to walk down there. All right, well, then I can walk down there. They're, they're all set for me to do that, so that sounds good. All right, I like to do the scripture memory from down here because I'm a little bit closer to you and my wife can help me when I get lost. All right, so we're on verses 12 to 16. Now, you had the New Year's holiday there, so, you know, a lot of things going on, but it still, trust you, took time to at least meditate on these verses. He finished up the verse number 11, speaking of... Um, the eternal purpose that he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, and then in whom, speaking of Christ Jesus our Lord, it's through him that we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him, again, speaking of Christ. And, and we read that in the New Testament as well, that we may come boldly before, his th before the throne of grace. Uh, and we are able to do that because of the blood of Christ. All right, so verses 12 to 16, and let's say it together. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, of, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his grace, of his glory, I'm sorry, that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man. I have probably been saying riches of his grace all along for the last month and a half that I've been working on that and didn't realize that I had it wrong because a number of places he talks about the riches of his grace, but this apparently is not one of those. All right, so next week we finish out chapter number three. Hard to believe we're already halfway through the book of Ephesians, uh, but the last verses 17 to 21, he's going to continue his petition. So he starts off in verse 16, I'm praying that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend what is the length and breadth and depth and height, speaking of God's love, the length and breadth and depth and height of his love, and to know the love of Christ that passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And I mentioned the other week, you know, when we pray, do we pray for people like that? Do we really pray for their spiritual needs? We pray about all the physical things, but do we really pray for the spiritual things, that, that those who, that we know that are saved, that God would strengthen them, 
uh, through the Holy Spirit for whatever they have to face that day at work. We talked on, on Sunday about how as a church we're to edify and encourage one another out of Ephesians chapter 13. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but exhort and encourage one another. All right, And so we ought to be praying for them that God will... Now, I don't know what you face during the week, but, but I need to pray that God will strengthen you through the Spirit to be able to do that, that Christ will dwell in your hearts, that you'll go by faith. You know, we hear all this stuff on the news. We don't know. You just have to trust God. Uh, and we need to pray that God will help us to walk by faith and not by sight. And then he talks about the love of Christ, you know, that we might pray for others, that they would, they would really understand the love of Christ in the heart, that they might be saved, that as believers, that we would act upon the love of God, that we would grow in that. He talks there about the knowledge, uh, growing in knowledge and increasing in knowledge. The love of God passes our knowledge, just like the peace of God that passes all understanding. All right? We don't always understand it, but we accept it by faith. And it's difficult to comprehend the love of God, and yet we accept it by faith. And then he ends up with a closing in verses 20 and 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And he mentions there about to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now it's interesting that he ends chapter 3 with a benediction. But that is not the end of the letter. That's the halfway point. So the first three chapters are basically his presentation of doctrine. And then in verses, chapters 4 through 6, he's going to give the application of all that. And that's when we'll get over in chapter 6 about the armor of God. So next week, we'll finish up chapter number 3. And then we'll be ready to head on into chapter number 4. All right, ushers, if you'll come at this time for our offering this evening. <clears throat> this is our Wednesday night benevolent offering. And we appreciate your faithfulness in giving to that. Brother Mark Littleton, would you pray for the offering tonight, please, sir? Two hundred and twelve, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Two hundred and twelve, what can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Two hundred and twelve, let's stand together as we sing this evening.
Thank you, and you may be seated. <laughs> Lord willing, I'll have my song leader back next week. And uh, that'll free my voice up just a little bit. Now, on Sunday, I got an email today. Brother Paul Deku Jr. is planning to stop by on Sunday. I believe he'll have his family with him, uh, provided that the forecasted weather does not interfere with our ability to meet on Sunday morning. Uh, we're also watching that closely. Uh, but uh, we've been praying for him, and God brought him through that difficult bout he had with COVID, and so hopefully he'll be able to be here and share a word of testimony as well. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Our text is actually Hebrews chapter 13. Last week, we were looking at the Abrahamic covenant. And tonight, I want to follow that up with a message dealing with the new covenant. We mentioned the New Covenant a little bit last week as we were going through the covenants in our book. We talked about the Noahic Covenant, the uh, Davidic Covenant, and then we had gone back to the Abrahamic Covenant, and of course we had the New Covenant in there as well. And each covenant, uh, we said, were God's promises to His people. And our emphasis last week is that God is faithful. What He has promised he will do. And so tonight, I want to look at this new covenant that God has given to us as believers and uh, how that should be an encouragement to our faith in the year ahead. Let's begin with prayer. Father, as we come to the word of God tonight, I pray that you'll encourage our hearts and our faith. We're thankful for the covenants that you have given us, Father, your, your word, your promises. We're especially thankful that thou art a faithful God, that you keep your word and what you have promised you will do and we can, re we can trust in it having a full assurance that you will accomplish your word, you'll accomplish your will in the way that you deem best for your honor and glory. Now, guide direct in thy Holy Spirit tonight in Christ's name. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 8, we'll begin reading in verses 1 and 2. It says, Now the things which ye have spoken, this is the sum. This is the conclusion. This is the, the sum total of everything that Paul, the writer of Hebrews has dealt with in the first seven chapters. He says, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. In chapter 7, the writer was dealing with the priesthood of Christ and how it relates to the priesthood of Melchizedek and the priesthood of Aaron. Jesus Christ is our high priest. He does not minister in a tabernacle made with hands, but in a true tabernacle that is in the heavenly. Now come down to verses 6 and 7. But now hath he, that is Christ, obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Christ is here identified as our mediator. As a mediator, Christ is the bridge between man and God. He is our intercessor. Specifically, he is the mediator of a better covenant. The first covenant was flawed in that it did not atone for the sin of all men. The animal sacrifices were not sufficient to take away the sin of man, and therefore they had to be repeated. Uh, you think about the Day of Atonement. Once a year, the high priest went into the holiest of holies to offer a sacrifice. But he had to repeat that every year. Christ was the fulfillment of that atonement, and we'll see that as we go. All right, so it says the first covenant, if, it had, if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for the second. But it wasn't faultless. It was only temporary. The writer of Hebrews said the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. It was a picture of the sacrifice yet to come in Jesus Christ. Then beginning in verse 8, it says, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Now, verse number 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. In verse 8, the writer is quoting Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, and we looked at that last week. 
He identifies this covenant as a new covenant. The new covenant was in no way dependent upon the first. Verse 10 reveals that it is an inward covenant, not an outward covenant. So this is not something where there is an agreement and two people shook hands on it or that they somehow entered into a, an outward agreement, but it is an inward commitment of the heart. Notice two things about this covenant in verse number 10. He says, I will write or put my laws into their mind and I'll write them in their hearts. The mind speaks of understanding. God is going to open uh, their understanding to this covenant, the nation of Israel. Of course, they are blinded. Uh, when the time of Christ, they were blinded. They didn't realize the Messiah was coming. They were blind to much of the promises of God. But God's going to open their understanding to be able to understand it. The heart speaks of the matter of faith and obedience. I will write them in the heart and they will obey them. Unlike the first commandment or the first covenant, as he mentions in verse 9, they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't follow it when they came out of Egypt. They refused to abide by his covenant. Uh, but the new covenant, they will obey because God's going to write it in their hearts. Now come over to our text in chapter 13. Chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. <clears throat> Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. In chapter 8, the new covenant was introduced as a covenant to Israel. But now the writer of Hebrews is going to make application to all believers. The God of peace that brought again Jesus Christ from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep. Well, who are the sheep? We are the sheep. We are part of the fold. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Jesus' blood was shed for our sin. And so we are part of this everlasting covenant. He says, make you perfect to complete in every good work to do his will. We have a responsibility to do the will of God. God is working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And of course, back in Ephesians chapter 1, three times you read that, Paul, that God was working according to the, his own purpose, according to what pleases him. Now, tonight, I want us to consider the effects or relevance of the new covenant in our lives. Jesus Christ's death on Calvary's cross was sufficient to atone for the sin of all men of all ages. Now, what relevance is that to us today? Number one, the new covenant leads to peace. It leads to peace. Apart from the new covenant, man is at enmity with God. We saw that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 to 16 and verse 19. We were at, before Christ died on Calvary's cross, we were outside of the covenants of promise with no hope, without God in this world. But Jesus Christ, it says, He is our peace who hath made both one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, and hath made himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and hath reconciled us both to God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Those without Christ are the enemies of God. If you are not for Christ, you are against him. If you are not of Christ, you are outside of Christ. There is no middle ground. What is it that separates us from God? And the answer is sin. Christ abolished that middle wall of petition, the sin. He died for our sin. He died for that which separates us from God, thereby reconciling us to God through his blood. His blood cleanses us of our sin. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we who once were far off are now made nigh by, to God by the blood of Christ. And as a result, instead of being strangers and enemies of God, we are made children of God, join heirs with Christ. We are become part of the household of the saints. We are part of his family. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The new covenant allows us to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ Instead of enmity, there is now peace. And so the new covenant leads to a peace with God. Secondly, it leads to perfection. It leads to perfection. The word perfect in Scripture does not speak of sinlessness, but rather of completion. 
In other words, God equips us and leads us so that we are able to accomplish every good work that falls within the realm of his will. Sometimes we fail to do God's will because we think we cannot do it. The fact is that God will never ask you to do that which he is not willing to enable you to do. God's call is God's enablement. The matter of perfection is a work in progress. It's not like God brings us to a point of perfection and then he's done. It's a continual, ongoing work. Remember in Ephesians, he mentions that God has given to the church pastors and evangelists and teachers for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the perfecting of the saints, that it brings us to a point of completion or perfection. And so God's will progresses, as God's will progresses, I should say, so does his working or equipping to accomplish his will in our lives. You know, as a young person, maybe a teenager, God's will for your life is going to require and expect more from you than when you were a child. You think about the little ones that we have downstairs. Maybe think of uh, Trevor and Rachel's little boys, Tanner and Oliver. All right, think about the will of God in their life. What is the expectation for a little child in terms of God's will? And then you think about someone who's older, a teenager or a young adult. Certainly, God's expectation is going to progress. It's going to, he's going to have a higher expectation of what you can do for God. And those of us who have, have been saved over a longer period of time, perhaps are more mature in the faith and have had gone through many experiences, God's expectation for us and his work in our lives is going to be different than it was when we were younger. Uh, God asks us to do different things. I think about Mr. Gordon, you know, and, and uh, how he teaches son, children's church and VBS and you think about years ago, he would have never dreamed about doing that. <laughs> and just like I would have never dreamed about preaching. Yeah, I mean, before I came to Bible Baptist Church, I had no intention of ever going into full-time ministry. And then when I did, I had no intention of ever preaching. And, and when I was assistant pastor, I had no intention of ever being the senior pastor. But God gradually works in our lives to perfect us and to bring us along to completion. If you knew where God was going to take you the moment you got saved to the end of your life, you probably would say, I don't want no part of this. <laughs> if you knew what God was going to expect of you, you'd probably say, ah, uh, that's more than I can handle. But God brings you along little bit by little bit and he reveals his will as you grow. Now, if I, if I don't accomplish or I'm not willing to listen to God and obey his will at point A, I don't reach point B, God repeats the lesson. He keeps working with me. I, I, and so the, the problem of getting from here to there may take longer, might be more painful for me as God brings chastening, rebuke, and reproof into my life to get me into his will. But he's constantly working to bring me to that point that he wants me. I remember in college, the first day of every college class, they gave you a syllabus. And in that syllabus, they, re, they told you everything that you were responsible for in that semester. Somebody got the bright idea that uh, college students need to know up front what was, what was expected of them and what they would have to do the whole semester. Well, when you go to college, you have Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes and Tuesday, Thursday classes for the most part. And so if school starts on Monday, on Monday, you go to every Monday, Wednesday, Friday class and they give you a syllabus. On Tuesday, you go to every Tuesday, Thursday class and they give you a syllabus. And by Wednesday, you're ready to quit college and go home because you're thinking, there's no way I can do all of this. This is impossible. I don't even know what they expect of me. I remember some of the assignments, they say, this, this semester you will do this. And I said, I don't even know what that is. And then they said, now don't worry about it. We're required to do this, but we will take you step by step. And by the time we get there, you'll be fine. And we were. But I'll tell you, when they told us up front what was expected, it scared us. It really scared us because it, it was overwhelming and we really had no idea how to do it. And if God showed you right up front everything he wanted for your life, it would, it would probably frighten you and you'd think, there's no way I can do that. But God brings you on little steps, little here, little there. You know, you think about, oh, I can never be a missionary. I can never go overseas and be away from my family. You know what God does? He takes you away for a little bit of time. He sends you to camp for a weekend. Then he sends you to camp for a week. And then he sends you away to be a counselor for a whole summer. And then he, then he, and he's gradually building in our lives and preparing us for the next step in life. I remember a boy in Sunday school, he was in the, the primary Sunday school class and he loved his teacher. And when it was time for him to, to promote to the next class, he refused to do it. He said, I don't want to grow up. I don't want to, I don't want to go to the next class. I like where I'm at. 
he ended up dropping out of church and quit coming because we wouldn't let him stay where he was the rest of his life. He's, you need to grow up. You need to move on with your class and go to the next classroom. And he, he ended up just quitting church altogether, um, you know, un- unfortunately. But sometimes we're like that with God. God, I don't want to grow up. I'm comfortable right where I am. Don't ask me to do any more. I just want to stay right here. And God says, you can't grow right there. You need to keep going in a forward progression. So this matter of perfection is a work in progress. Don't allow apprehension or fear to discourage you from God's purpose in your life. Turn back to Romans chapter 8. And again, a familiar passage of Scripture to many of us. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse number 27. Romans 8, 27. And he that searcheth the hearts. Now, who is that? Well, that's God. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. And here's the conclusion. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God says, I want you to do this, you know, Lord, I can't do that. If God be for us, who can be against us? Notice that the will of God precedes the work of God. One could also state the will of God governs the work of God. God's work is always in terms of his will. God never works contrary or in opposition to his will. He's not going to ask you to do something that's outside the will of God. When you resist or go against the will of God in your life, God ceases to work for you and instead begins to work against you in order to turn you back into his will. And so we see here the promise that all things work together for good, that it is directly connected to God's will or purpose. And if we are in God's will, we are sure to victory because God is greater than any adversary or opponent that might arise. If God is working in your life to equip you for some good work, no one can stop that work except you. If God says, this is what I want you to accomplish, God will enable it to happen regardless of the circumstances The only one that can stop it is you if you say, I'm not willing to do it. So we see the new covenant leads to peace. It leads to perfection. Number three, it leads to pleasing. Responding by faith to the work of God in our lives pleases God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently Seek him. Everything that God does in your life is for the purpose of building and encouraging your faith. And as a Christian, it ought to be our desire to please God in everything that we do. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. There are a number of things that Paul mentions to Timothy in this passage. He says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Remember we talked about in Ephesians, praying for strength in the inner man. Paul's saying to Timothy, Be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Verse 2, And these things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, and here it is, that he may please Him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. God wants us to do everything to please him. When Jesus Christ was baptized, what what did God say, the voice from heaven? He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. If we are to please God, not only must we live by faith, but we must guard against worldly entanglements. Probably the greatest hindrance to spiritual growth in Christians today are worldly entanglements entanglements. We're simply unwilling to give up the things of this world in order to serve Christ. We are unwilling to endure hardship and consider it an offense even to be asked to do so. We are deceived into thinking that we have rights and refuse to be held accountable for our responsibilities. In essence, we have become a spoiled generation. 
there are, when you think about the allurements or the entanglements of the world, I think, first of all, the matter of the allurements of modern entertainment, TV, video, computer games, DVDs, have replaced time with the Lord and with family. An overemphasis on sports and Hollywood has created an environment of virtual reality that is anything but real. Our minds are being molded and shaped by that which is contrary to the word of God. We get so engrossed in worldly entertainment. And then there's the allurement of modern technology. Cell phones, the internet. They have made communication constant and immediately. Unfortunately, we spend so much time communicating that most of our communication is worthless and meaningless. In essence, we spend hours saying nothing. You ever been a part of a group text and you send out a text and your phone goes ding, 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 and you look at it and you get all these thumbs up. Everybody sends a thumb. <laughs> not a word, not, not even a word, just a, just a picture where they use some abbreviation and send you something and, and I, I have no idea what they mean, like an LOL or, or whatever. And I, I guess at that one time, Mr. Stoner used to laugh at me because I, I didn't know what it meant. I gave the wrong definition apparently of it. We don't communicate like we used to. We don't use real sentences and real words. But everybody's got to put their two cents in. I finally said, you know, even I, sometimes I'll send out a group text and say, please do not respond to this. This is just for your information. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> they can't help themselves but hit that, hit that thumbs up button or send something back. Okay, I understand. Well, no, you don't understand. You just replied when I said not to. <laughs> Worldly influence so captivates us that we become increasingly unwilling even to consider separation from it. Those who would ask us to do without such modern conveniences and devices, we consider to be unreasonable. So when we take the young people to camp, we say, no cell phones. You can't take them with you. If you've got them, leave them at home. I love uh, John Bott at the Wilds. He says, yeah, you know, so, so mom sent her son to camp. He got to camp. He turned his phone into, the count, into his, his sponsor and said, here's my phone. The next day, this cabin counselor took a phone off of him. The next day, <laughs> they got a third phone off of him. <laughs> <laughs> that was the one he was, he was hiding under the blankets that they weren't supposed to find. They figured if he gave in two, they went, they'd stop looking. <laughs> yeah, the parents, hey, you need a phone. I need to keep in contact with you. And it, it, it is unreasonable for you to even suggest that I have that separation. The problem is that a life that is characterized by the things of the world cannot please God. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, we're familiar with the passage, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You cannot love the world and love God at the same time. You cannot live for the world and live for God at the same time. And if we, we live for the world, then we cannot please God. Turn over to James chapter 4, verse 4. James 4, 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, and that's language. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Not only can you not please God when you live for the world, but God says, you're not my friend, you're my enemy. You are an adulterer, an adulteress. You have rejected your first love, that is Christ. And instead you have pursued after the ungodliness of the world. Come back then to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 22, and we'll close this evening. Hebrews 13, 22. We had read verses 20 and 21. Verse 21, he'll make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in, that, in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And you would think that's the end, but he goes on. Verse 22, he says, And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. The writer of Hebrews knew that his message would be hard to swallow. I mean, for the, for the Jews, the Hebrews, what he was writing to them was basically saying, everything you have believed up to this point, you need to turn from and follow Christ. 
Now, what they believed up to that point was a picture of Christ that was to come, but they were so unwilling to let go of that and to accept the new covenant. He said, I beseech you, suffer. That means allow the word of exhortation. Listen willingly. The word of God is a sharp sword, and when it does its cutting work, it hurts. It can be spiritually and emotionally painful. Nevertheless, it is necessary for our good. Whenever God's word brings convictions, we need to be willing to accept it as from the Lord. Instead of getting angry at the preacher or angry at the teacher, we need to allow God's word to do the work that God intends for it to do. And then I like this phrase, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Have you ever read the book of Hebrews from start to finish in one setting? I would not consider it a short book. I would not consider it a few words. But basically what that phrase tells us is that the author could have said a lot more. He could have gone on. But at the same time, what he said was sufficient to address the issue. You know, it is impossible to exhaust the word of God. You will never hear all the preaching you need. That's why it's important not to miss the opportunities that God avails us to be at the house of God and to sit under the preaching of God's word. We need the preaching of God's word. You never reach a point where you outgrow that. So the new covenant leads to peace, perfection, and pleasing. Is your life pleasing to the Lord? Are you at peace with God? Are you going on to perfection? Jesus Christ shed his blood on Calvary's cross in order to make this new covenant. And we need to determine today that we are going to live under the blood and allow God to use us and to bless us that he might be able to bring us to a point of completion and perfection, not only in this life, but especially in that which is to come when we receive our glorified body. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time in thy word tonight. We thank you for the new covenant, the everlasting covenant through the blood of Christ, that we have an eternity to look forward to in heaven and with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the presence of God because of this covenant. We're thankful that you are willing to place this covenant in our hearts and in our minds. Help us to understand the will of God. Help us to obey the will of God by faith that we might live a life that is pleasing unto thee. As we look forward to the new year, help us not to quit or to faint or to give up, but to press on for thy honor, for thy glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.